All right, my friends, we got James Larson in the house. We're going to be talking about a DIY speaker from Parts Express. James, how are you doing? Happy New Year to you. Uh, Happy New Year to you too, Gene, and all of our viewers. Yes, we've got um, um, this speaker we just posted a review on, this thing behind well, behind me, it's called the, um, it's from Parts Express. It's a kit called the Orion. It's a weird name. There was already a kit available out there called the Orion. And they were initially, yeah, they were going to initially going to call this Orion, but then someone like, oh, we're going to get this kit confused with another kit called the Orion. And um, so uh, they just changed it to Orion, but you can still call Orion because there's the, like, the way it's spelled isn't really a real word, so it's just a name. Yeah, but yeah. you know that that flapped me up too because when I saw it, I thought it was Orion, and then there's an A in it. I'm like, that's not how you spell Orion. And I do remember from like the 80s or 90s, there was a DIY kit that was the Orion. Yeah, it's an older it DIY tower. kit. Yeah, it was like a I think it was an open back tower called the, the TL Orion or something. Oh, maybe you're right. I I don't remember, but anyway, to avoid confusion. They just they didn't want to redo the whole name. Just, we'll just tweak it the name a little bit called the Orients. I'm like, okay, <laughs> it works. Well, let me explain to you guys what DIY means on this because most people, when they look at reviews on YouTube, they look at finished products, products that you buy from a manufacturer that's pre-assembled, finished, everything's done. You just get them out of the box, plug them in, and they work. That's not the case with this speaker from Parts Express. What James actually has here is a kit speaker. So all the parts come to you, all the drivers, the crossover parts, the assembly board, the MDF, all that stuff comes to you. But James actually had to assemble this speaker. He had to follow a set of instructions, assemble this whole thing, assemble the crossovers, put all the stuff together, finish and paint the product. So, I mean, how long did it take you to put this kit together? Um, the assemb- Well, I, first of all... I- I hadn't done this before, so this is the first time for me. And it would, I had to learn how to do it, so it took a lot longer than it would an experienced like speaker builder or woodworker. So it did take a while. I would say probably for the um, enclosure and drivers and uh, crossover assembly, probably a week. But then mm-hmm. to paint it, probably three weeks. But because I had to let it dry, put primer on it, sand it, paint it, do you know, over and over again to get the kind of finish I wanted right. So it took a long time because I, when I did this uh, uh, kit, it was like in the fall and it was cold out. And so it took a long time for each coat to dry. And so it took a long time to get oh. to get things looking like I wanted to look. So, yeah. So, I, I mean. How did you how did you choose the color? I mean, did you have a color in mind that you wanted to go with or did they give you suggested colors that would go with that box? Um, I, I wanted something because every okay. Every speaker I review is either black or wood trim. Once in a while, I get a white one, but I rarely get one that's like a, a nice, vibrant color, right? And so I wanted mm-hmm. a speaker that looked different. So it had to be a primary color or something bright and vivid and something that I hadn't had before. And so I, I chose blue because um, I think it's cool. I'm, like I, I wanted a satin blue, actually, because um, when I see like satin blue on a car, I think that's the coolest color. So I kind yeah. of chose it after my, uh, uh, if I had like, you know, like, cool car and I could have any kind of paint or a job I wanted, I would go satin blue. And so I went with that on these speakers. It looks cool. So if you guys look at the detail on the speaker, this is actually a three-way speaker. Even though you see two drivers, there's a little tweeter in the middle of that mid-range driver. It's a concentric driver. And that's what James will give you more information on that. So it's kind of a, I haven't seen a lot of kit designs that use a concentric driver. Usually it's a two-way or it's a three-way separate drivers. So that's interesting that um, Parts Express came out with a solution like this. Yeah, one of the things that drew me to this kit and finally getting into like a DIY kit was this is a very unusual speaker. It's it's not only a um, three-way with coaxial um, tweeter mid-range. It's also uh, a dipole because the the back uh, of the enclosure uh, is open to the just to the mid-range, and so the mid-range is reflecting sound out of the back of the speaker, and so like. It's a dipole, coaxial, full range stand mount speaker. It's very unique, and there's not really anything like it, even in like you know, um, ready to go, you know, finished speakers. It's it's an unusual design, and so I I, I saw it at uh, an Expono I think last year. It's like this is really cool, so let's do this. And, like, and you know what? For what it is, um, what all the components you're getting in it. 
I know the retail was like six seventy a kit, but it's actually on sale for five forty right now uh, on Parts Express website. I'll put links. We don't have any affiliate with them, but I'll put a link for anyone that's interested in doing something like this. But you have a PowerPoint presentation here. I want to bring this up now so you can kind of go over this. And this will be available on our Patreon channel if you guys want to download this PDF on patreon.com slash audioholics. You could certainly do that. So James, I'm going to have you walk through what we're looking at here. Sure. Okay. The, the specs um, are, um, so um, it's obviously like you said, it's a three-way with a, um, a coaxial mid-range, a five-inch uh, mid-range driver and a one-inch uh, dome tweeter. Um, the, the, the base driver is a, a pretty long, uh, good high excursion eight inch base driver. I think it gets, I don't, not quite 10 um, millimeters, but it's, it's a pretty heavy duty driver for stand mount speakers, especially yeah, the like, X max. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, it's a, it's a four ohm speaker as we'll see the sensitivity isn't too high, but I measured it to be higher than what they're spec'd at as 83 DB for one watt at one meter. But. Nope. Well, that, that's the problem. When they rate it at one watt, that's a disadvantage to four ohm speakers because that's 2.83 volts would be two watts. So they really should be rating it at 2.83 volts, which will add a few more dB of sensitivity to that spec. Yeah, I measured like something like 85 dB for, for yeah, it makes sense. volts. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And, and, and these are, so these are stand mount speakers, but they are big ones. So if you're looking for like a modestly sized stand mount speakers, these are not that. But if you want a speaker that can go on like a shelf or something that's truly full range, as we'll see when we get into the slideshow, these are these are that for sure. So they got good power handling. I mean, that according to that means to me they use some pretty good parts in the crossovers and the drivers and stuff. Oh, for sure. So here's here's um you know pictures of how they came and uh, the parts unpacked. You can see the the boards are it, it's pretty well packed and everything you need is here except for the paint. Or if you wanted to add feet, that's too personal, so they don't supply feet. Whatever feet you want, you have to supply yourself because people have such different preferences in that respect. But yeah, but they give you everything you and you just put it together and paint it. You know, that's that's the part all all laid out there. Um, it's a big crossover board. This isn't like a tiny little crossover. Look at the size of that PCB. In fact, <laughs> I'm going to share. Uh, you have a time elapsed video you put together yeah. here. Yeah, so you have to put together the crossover. What's really cool is they supply the board. And um, the board, it shows you what parts you need to put and where to put them and everything. So like, um, uh, here I am, I'm, I'm hot gluing the parts on and then soldering the um, the leads onto the board itself. So the, what's cool is it makes crossover assembly really easy, this board, right? You don't have to supply your own board and everything is really outlined for you. So that's a good board, even though it's kind of an advanced kit. This is um, this board makes it really easy um, for somebody who you know wants to do this who hasn't done this sort of thing before. So that's a, this is a huge plus for a DIY kit to have a, a board laid out like this. Most most DIY court kits don't have a board like or, or any anything like this. They just supply you the. I mean, they just give you the crossword components and you're on your own to like you know put them on some kind of uh, breadboard or something. You know. No, it's really slick. They even tell you the value of the components. You know, they show you the size of the components. I mean, it just makes it the guesswork takes the guesswork out of it. That's pretty cool. Yeah. It's, um, the instru I should say, oh, I mean, getting into the, uh, the assembly, the, a lot of kits, they just give you the parts and the schematic of the crossover and that's it. Right. So what, what's, what's really cool about this kit is the, the instruction, um, the assembly manual, it, it, it really holds your hand step by step. To like to you know to help build the thing right so it, it it very clearly explains what you need to do next right and so like even though it's like i said it's an advanced kit you could still do this if you're a novice like me because the instruction manual is so clear and so detailed in every step and so that's a huge plus for a kit like this i yeah i i would have struggled if i didn't have a, a such a well-written like uh, assembly manual that's a huge right. yeah, it's really good Here's a couple pictures of the uh, assembly. Of just like I have all these clamps gluing the enclosure together, you know that and like um, yeah. It, so you, you need clamps, obviously. You need a few tools to put this together. Wood glue, you need clamps, and um, a few other things like a hot glue gun and stuff like that, and and certain types of glue. Um, yeah. So it, you know you should have some experience <laughs> in assembly. You shouldn't be someone that's never put anything together, never worked with wood, never did any gluing, or you know you have to have some 
Well, you know, I, I, I didn't really have a whole lot of experience in this type of like woodwork. And I still managed to put this together and get a good result. So I think if you just. Yeah, but you're James Larson, man. Come <laughs> on. Come on. You take things outside. You measure 70 pound speakers. You put them up, uh, suspend them on. You're not the typical average bear. Yeah. If I think, though, I don't think you have to be that intimidated by it. If you just follow the instructions, if you read the instructions um, through before you even sh uh, start the assembly and and like um, look up and, and like, you know, uh, guides and tutorials for the stuff you don't know, you could do this kit. I did. I did, and I didn't. I've never put together a speaker or anything like a speaker before. And I, I think I did a pretty good job of it. So, well, this know. could be your calling in the future, James. <laughs> I don't know, man. It took a long time. Yeah, uh, you have. Yeah, I mean, you can do that without having experience, but you're you're gonna. It's gonna take a lot of time to you know learn how to do all these things. You know, like the kit itself doesn't have these rounded edges, right? I ha I got like, this plane. It's called the corner plane to get the rounding on these edges. And I, I went through a lot of tutorials to get the kind of finish I wanted. And even then, the finish isn't perfect. It's good, but it's not perfect. But like, you know, I went through a lot of tutorials to kind of get the results I wanted. And so, like, if you're willing to do that, you you can be a novice at this and still get a good result. You know, so yeah, you don't have right. to. Be, yeah, it, it just takes time. That's all. And here, you know, like I said, here here's some uh, pictures. There's the uh, open back to the um, the mid range on the right side of the picture. It has this kind of a cool pattern on it, and you can see there's like some damping on the side the sidewalls of the interior passage from the mid-range. And so these are dipoles. And but you so, could close that off if you want. They give you extra padding in there. You can control yeah. how much sound comes out of the back of that speaker, right? Yeah, they give you some acoustic damping that you can put in there. It doesn't fully seal it, but it does um, damp the sound that comes out of the... So you don't have to have a full dipole speaker. Kind of, it kind of makes it like a partial dipole. Some sounds would still escape it, but not a whole lot. It, mm -hmm. it damps about 6 dB. I, I measured it both ways, and it reduces the sound output about 6 dB, which is substantial. That's a substantial amount of like, you know, reduction. So yeah, yeah. you can go to the. I next thought slide. I saw two ports in the kit. Was that just an extension so you can make the port longer? Oh no, the the ports you saw were one port for each speaker. <laughs> oh duh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here here you are bringing it up on that table over there, measuring it outside. And the reason why James Larson takes these speakers outside is he wants to measure the actual speaker, not the room interaction. That way he knows how accurate, um, you know, the consistency of the speaker is and how it actually measures without the influence of the room. Yeah, you can't really do this in a room unless you have some very, you know, very precise, very special equipment. This can't be done yeah. in a room because there's too many reflective surfaces. And, and outdoors, you only have to worry about one reflective surface. That's the ground. And like and that's easy to filter out of the measurements. And so I get pretty good, uh, you could say anechoic measurements. I only have one one echo to worry about. And I can filter that out. So it's, it's essentially anechoic. And so my results are, are anechoic. Right. And okay, here's a spinorama. You know, this is kind of a complex graph. Um, yeah. If so, if you want to know, I mean, we have guides that show you that what all these like, curves and lines mean but the yeah it's linked up in the review if you want to read the written review on audiohawks.com there's tutorials on how to read these graphs and whatever yeah <laughs> anyway so it's not a perfect graph but it's pretty good and i like the voicing of it um it's like there's a few like i, I would say ripples and like the mid bass frequency but they're not really large in magnitude you're talking about a couple db really and um and as you go, uh, but the mid range uh, from like a kilohertz to like five kilohertz is very flat. It's very smooth on axis and like in your listening window, it's very good. And that's really, you know, really you'd want that most because that's the region where human uh, hearing is the most sensitive. And it's like mm -hmm. very flat, very, very nice neutral in that region. And then um, the, the trouble is attenuated somewhat. Yeah, and, I see and, that. Yeah, yeah. At so above that, five kilohertz. Yeah, there's a little bit of a drop off in trouble. and. That might, I mean, it, it also has to do with the way um, you you can measure uh, coaxial speakers. It's hard to measure like treble accurately with a coaxial gyro because of the way the, the woofer kind of reflects the sound of the tweeter. And so like, oh. so, but this is, as, I think is as fair and accurate as I could get it. And um, so it's a, it's a warm speaker. The treble is somewhat attenuated. It's not, it's not blazing hot. If you're looking for a warm sound, this this speaker will give you that. And also, what this doesn't show you, but we'll see in a little bit, is like the 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 bass range is also a little elevated. So the tweeter is slightly 
like um, uh, decreased, whereas the woofer is slightly increased in, in magnitude. And so it gives it kind of like a warm, very easy, non-fatiguing sound. I, I really like that. I, I don't like the opposite when you have, when you emphasize treble. If, if anything, you know, I like a de de-emphasized treble because I'm, you know, I, I've got some might be sensitive to it or something. That's just. I mean, the bottom line is you could go and add a shelving filter in your own system above five kilohertz and just boost the treble a couple of dB if you find it too laid back. Yeah. Another interesting thing here, we see the directivity indexes. There's a, 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 a another, you know, other reviewers who are looking at this or, or people who are looking at graphs. Oh, those are terrible directivity indexes, right? There's a huge yep. like error around like, say, eight kilohertz or so. But that, that's because, that this is deliberate because the mid-range is open-backed, right? So there's sound coming out of the back of the oh, speaker yeah. that's not really featured on the um, on-axis or, or listening window. But like, so that makes uh, the, there's a lot more sound coming out all, from all angles within the mid-range's, um, you know, bandwidth. And so like- Because it's um, a dipole, basically. At mid-frequencies, it, it acts like a dipole. Yeah, there's sound coming out of the back of the speaker too, so that you can't really judge the directivity, and you can't say, "Oh, this is some kind of terrible problem." No, it's not a mistake. This is the way it's supposed to be, and so like. And and that's why I did that video last week. That measurements don't tell you everything, right? Because how it plays in the room is the ultimate factor. How it sounds in the room. I mean, this was a deliberate thing done to the design of the speaker because it's a dipole. And now, obviously, if that back was closed, they probably would have tuned the crossoverly the crossover differently as a result. Yeah. So like, um, yeah, you, you the, 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 with the directivity indexes, you can't say like, they're not like, there's not, there's not really a neutral directivity index. Like you can have a like neutral frequency response. The directivity index is like, it, it's different and it's a little bit more complicated. So like it, this, this has certain ranges that has more or sound coming out or for a certain frequency bands than others. And like, but that's the way the speaker is supposed to sound because we, they want to emphasize spaciousness over certain um, frequency bands given uh, its dipole design. And that's the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Here's um, a frequency response over um, well, uh, uh, over the 90 degree angle on the horizontal axis. So like this is just what it's doing horizontally. And it, it's like, it's pretty flat. I'll, you know, the, the more flat you see, if it looks like a flat plane, the better. As we get in the trouble, there, there's sort of rockiness on the uh, off-axis um, regions, you know, those off-axis angles, and like, mm -hmm. and, and so it it does it, it does start to um, squeeze the treble a little bit, and it gets it becomes a little rockier because this this coaxial driver isn't isn't quite as refined as some of the best coaxial drivers, but it gets the job done, and like, um, you know, it, you can you can listen to this over a, a semi-wide angle and get. Um, a good response, although there might be holes in the trouble region, some like relatively sharp holes, you know, it'll, it'll still sound fine though, you know. So would you say you would tow the speakers into the listening area? I would say if you can, angle yeah. them to be angled from to uh, face the listener directly, but if you can't do that, and if you're off like by say 20 degrees, it'll still sound fine. You just might have a little notch in like eight kilohertz, right? It's not gonna be a big, you know, hor horrible sound that you'll get. It'll sound fine. You know, just maybe not perfect if you're really listening critically to it, the speaker. Right. And, and so here's that same graph, but given a profile view, and this kind of shows you what, like, I guess individual angles are doing better, right? I, I get a clearer look at individual angles. And so you can see the on axis spot uh, response is where you really want to be at. But if you aren't, there's like, there's, uh, I guess, treble flares off axis that kind of shore that up a bit. And so, like, even if you're off axis, you're still going to get trouble. It's a, it's a little bit of a wonky trouble response, but I, I, for me, it sounded fine. It was very listenable, you know. And like you said, if you wanted more trouble, you could boost it a bit and get like I would I would only boost it by like two dB if you wanted the trouble to, the trouble to yeah. be in line with the mid range. And so yeah, you could just use a tone control if you have a receiver with bass and treble, just knock it up two dB and you'd probably be good. But I didn't I didn't feel a need for that because it sounded fine to me. So like I wouldn't I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that personally, but I like a kind of a warmer sound signature, you know, sure. if, if not neutral. And so here's kind of like, you know, the same, this is the same response, but like a top down view and uses colors instead of lines to show you the amplitude response. And so this basically shows you the best response is going to happen on axis. And as you move like that, that central, if you drew a, like imaginary line through the central 
uh, right through the central part of this picture, you'd have the most solid red, and that would mean the most response is the most even. But if you went outside of that, things get a little rocky in the trouble region where you, you can see the, the trouble kind of recesses and narrows down, but there's still these flares off axis that you'll still, still hear the trouble, and it'll still sound fine, but it'll probably- I don't know why, like, but I look at this graph and it reminds me of that Atari game, Yars of Revenge. You that know, little, I can't, I can't the, the picture butterfly that. <laughs> creature. Yeah, because I just got an Atari VCS. They sent me over Christmas and I, and I played the re-imaged version of the game. And it's giving me that vibe right now, just looking at that. To me, it looks like almost like an onion. Are th those bells that kind of have a round bottom, you know? Like, yep. yeah, it looks like an ornament. Maybe like a, if you, like, if I rotated this graph by 90 degrees, it'd look like, like an ornament or something. It could be. Know. You put it on your Christmas tree. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, and here's here's a uh, uh, the base uh, response. The base right? response, yeah. I, I I did this also anechoically outdoors. You can't do this uh, on like, you know, free air like that one picture with the ladder and everything. You need to do this on the ground with the mic also on the ground to get rid of all the reflect reflections. But uh, this the whole range. So the the woofer's range is like thirty hertz to like five hundred hertz, and the woofer is about like I would say at two dB hot on average, and that does give the um, speaker some character like like it, it tilts it a little bit away from neutral and so this it's not like bass heavy or anything but it's a warm speaker and this this kind of accentuates that. Um, well, character. you got good bass extension down to thirty hertz like that. You probably don't need a subwoofer in most cases when you're listening to music. Oh, definitely not. Yeah, this this is one one of the strengths of the speaker. You get in, in a room, you're going to get solid bass down to thirty hertz. You don't need a subwoofer. And and these you know both these these are bookshelf speakers with heavy duty like eight inch sub drivers and so yeah. like they do really well in, in bass and like yeah it's just it's really good I, I uh, if if you need a speaker that you can put on a shelf and you don't have floor space for something like a subwoofer or a floor or a floor stand speaker yet you still want a full range sound right with serious bass the speaker is awesome for that I mean it's really good mm -hmm. here's um um picture of the electrical load uh, the electrical impedance and phase and like uh, not a lot to say here except there's just no problems right it's a fine a four speaker. Ohm speaker basically yeah it's a four ohm speaker but you know most speakers really are four ohms and like there's yeah. nothing problematic about this i wouldn't i wouldn't take a really cheap amp and try to you know crank the speaker hard for hours on end right because it is a four ohm speaker but if you put it on any avr and like and, and didn't go crazy it, it's gonna be fine you know this is it's a look you could tell the in, the engineer that designed this did his homework and he kept the impedance minimum you know above the iec recommendation for four ohms which is 3.2 ohms and yeah there's, there's nothing bad here the saddle points are symmetric i mean it's just you know it looks like a good impedance plot it doesn't look the phase angles aren't crazy yeah like i guess the you could say that no news is good news and there's no news here it's normal impedance plot, right. you know it's it's fine and like so yeah you can use it with any avr basically and it'll it'll uh be great so bottom line the pros like summing the speaker up the uh going over the pros and cons the, to start with the tremendous base for a standout speaker so if like i said if you don't have room for a floor or floor space for a floor standing speaker the base on this thing is as good as any floor standing speaker unless it's like a crazy over the top one like the ones you got gene um yeah but like for a normal it's it's a it's a it's a tower speaker in a uh, stand mount speaker form, basically. That's what the speaker mm -hmm. is. And, and uh, if you like an easy, non-fatiguing sound, um, this, this gives you that because it, it, it boosts the bass up just a little and it uh, de-emphasizes the treble just a bit, right? R with respect to neutrality. But the mid-range is completely flat, very neutral. And so the, uh, for me, it sounds great. But if you like, say if you like, uh, uh, you know, hot treble or like a really detailed, like, spicy sound right mm, you, you could get that from the speaker but you'd have to like eq the treble of course yeah and and, uh, and what's cool about um coaxial speakers is that they can they have a flexibility of placement that like a normal two-way or three-way wouldn't right like this speaker you could rotate it on its side and it'll sound the same okay like you can't do that with a normal two-way bookshelf speaker because chances are you'll be in some kind of crossover null right if you're mm -hmm. listening to it on, on the vertical axis, well, this the vertical response on this speaker is about the same as this horizontal response. So you could set, you could lay the speaker on its side if you don't have the height for the speaker, 
and it'll sound the same. So that's I think that's a big advantage in placement and flexibility. Also, it's a, because it's a coaxial, it, the near field is much, the summation of the drivers is much sooner. So you could have it as a near field monitor on a desktop. It's big for a desktop, but yeah, you, don't have to sit, you don't have to sit that far away from it to get a cohesive sound stage out of it. Yeah, you could you could sit you could listen to the speaker like a half meter, and the the, the yeah. sound would cohere. And you can't you couldn't do that with a normal tower speaker. No way, a tower speaker you want like two yep. meters, you know. So like, yep. and, and like and like, uh, I, we didn't go over like the sound character too much, but this is a dipole speaker, so it gives you a spacious sound, although not the best imaging, right? It, there's since there's reflections coming out from the back, you can damp them a bit to get better Im imaging. But if you don't want if you want a big sound that goes everywhere, right, and all everything to image big, the speaker does that well. But if you're the type of like audiophile who wants things to image precisely, right, and to have like a like a more a narrow sound stage, these, these speakers don't do that at all. So like, I like I like that. I appreciate both. Like um, I appreciate both approaches, and I I I, I kind of like these for, for that. You know, I have speakers that do the other thing, and uh, these do that the thing that you know. The opposite yeah. of that, and I yeah, I'm they're not sure. they're not laser focused like a Perlison speaker where the imaging is just dead center precise, right? So it's a no, different, just a different experience. Yeah, it, everything's big. If you like a big image, almost like um, line arrays, right? Line arrays, mm -hmm. they don't image precisely, but everything is bigger than life, like an IMAX theater, and these kind of do that. And I I like I like that, you know. I, but I, I want to have you know both approaches. You know, sometimes I do want like a like, you know, a nice uh uh precise center image right and like so i, I like having these because uh, the the speakers out you know they, those can't do what these can do but these can't do what those can do and it's nice to have kind of both speakers and the cool that's thing why you have multiple setups in your house that's the smart way to do it i know so you know what's cool is since I, this is assembled kit I can't really send it back, right, to Parts mm -hmm. Express, right? Normally, our policy is to send our, our review speakers back, but I don't, I can't do these with these because I already messed everything up by assembling it, right? So these are keepers for me, and now I have speakers. I have like, um, you know, conventional speakers, and also these speakers that give you like a huge image, you know, which which I can appreciate. You know, it would probably be cool to watch movies on that if you, because you you don't do a lot of multi-channel watching, as far as I know, right? You do mostly. You do what when you watch movies? It's mostly in two channel, right? It's mostly in two channel. I mean, I have I have multi channel setups, but since I'm only ever listening, you know, I I review so much. I just I'm mostly listening just to like the two speakers that I'm reviewing. Yeah. I don't bring in the surround system. So yeah. So this would be a fun speaker to watch movies on. You know, like if you're just setting up a two channel system, this might be advantageous for someone that only is going to pick two speakers, and they also want the pleasure of making it themselves. They want to have the pride of ownership that hey. I use my hands to put this together. This is kind of that product that fits that bill, and it's not unreasonably priced. It's under six hundred dollars oh, yeah, for the very whole good. thing. If, if look, these speakers, I keep on pointing to my because I'm looking at the screen, so I'm pointing to my right when I think it's on my left. Oh, but yeah. these speakers, like, okay, for as I built them, if uh, like you tried to buy something like this MSRP retail, they would be I don't know three thousand more than three thousand dollars, right? But on yeah. sale right now, you can get them for like just a bit over five hundred, right? I mean, you still have to buy the paint and whatever tools you need to put them together. Like the the corner plane I bought for them was like thirty bucks, but like in the end, it's a, a crazy good value if you're willing to invest the time in them. And and, and also going back to your point about them being like, if you want a, just a pair of speakers for home theater, these are also good for that since the the dipole design since there's sound coming out of the back of them that provides more late reflections than a normal speaker and it gives you a more spacious sound stage right and so you mm -hmm. can get more of like a surround sound almost surround sound experience with these than a normal speaker that only shoots you know that'll have less late reflections or sh shoot sound only from one angle out from it so like yeah they're, they're, they're a very um like almost swiss army knife speaker right they do a lot you know the other thing too because of the way they diffuse they kind of diffuse or disperse the sound within the room probably means that you could you don't have to sit in a sweet spot you could sit over to the left or the right a little bit and still have that spacious sound so it's really if you have if you have a large gathering of of people sitting down to listen to music the speaker could sound it could get it it could give a good experience for everyone sitting in the room i think so i don't know if it would be less i mean they still image we're not i'm not saying they don't do stereo imaging they still do stereo imaging and you still you still have the 
you know, the um, problems of if you're not in the sweet spot of, of like a stereo pair of speaker, then the soundstage gets tilted for one way or the other. These yeah. might be a little less susceptible to that, right? Because of because there's so much, there's a lot more light reflections from these speakers than, than a typical loudspeaker. But uh, maybe I, I haven't, I didn't really do a lot of off axis listening with these. So I can't say, but that might be, you know, that might be something. I, I think if you have a stereo spare, pair of speakers, there, there's nothing that that's going to give you like good good center imaging when you're off axis unless you do that thing um what do you call it um time you, intensity trading yeah, yeah time mm -hmm. intensity trading and these would not be good candidates for it you you would need um narrow dispersion speakers these right. are the opposite kind of speakers you want for that i keep on pointing to the wall over there when i'm looking at the screen but the speaker is on my left not my right you know so um, you know, if you do the mirror and stream yard so it flips it next time. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to. <laughs> but stop yeah. looking like an idiot. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. Well, look, guys, uh, you, you know, like I said, we don't normally do DIY kit reviews, but if you give us a lot of comments down below and if you want to see more of these kind of things, maybe we could do one a year. Maybe we could volunteer James to become a pro and then he could start making these things regularly. You know, that's it's just uh, it all depends on if you guys are interested and seeing more of these reviews. I just think it was a cool project for you, uh, uh, James. It kind of gives you some respect for people that are designing speakers, right? To see just all the little intricacies of the design and getting to open it up and, and put it together from scratch. It's just, I think it gives you a, a unique perspective for a reviewer to go through that process. Yeah, I mean, putting together a speaker, like it's not super easy when you've never done it before. So like there's like things like putting the cross mounting the crossover board inside the speaker cabinet was kind of a pain, right? And it's kind of a pain to wire everything, especially when you're going through like these closed chambers through like speaker terminals and stuff like that. It's it's not easy. It's definitely yeah, it definitely gives me more of a appreciation for the you know just designing the speaker and building it. Yeah, time. and you got to make sure the thing's not rattling. So sometimes a wire can get a wire could hit against the port, and that's why you got to put some type of foam or something or secure the wires. Little things like that. Um, yeah, that, that's exactly what I had to do it with these because I had a wire that was knocking against the port. So I put some um, damping around the port and tied the wire to it. So now that problem went away. So like there was a lot of little things like that that you know I had to deal with. But in the end, like you know, I'm happy with the pro uh, end result. So it's it's worth it for me. I mean. Read the review. That's all I can say. The, the review goes in more depth than we can here, you know. So, you know, that's, and you can decide whether it's a good fit for you if you want to invest the time uh, to to make a speaker like this. Cool. Well, James, I appreciate your work here, guys. Uh, if you want to check out his review, look at the link down below. The full editorials on audiohawks.com. If you like this video, please hit the thumb up, hit the subscribe. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com/slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to suggest video topics. And I do want to promote, we have a contest going right now. I want to see if I still have the image for it. We're giving away a pair of Martin Logan F100s. This is running until the end of January. So you have a little bit, or about two weeks to enter this thing. This is a great speaker. It run our mid-priced uh, Tower Speaker of the Year for 2023. I got to hear these speakers multiple times. Matthew Pose did the review. He did the measurements. He did the listening tests. I asked Martin Logan to sponsor this contest because I wanted you guys to have a chance to win the really cool gear that we review. So please make sure you enter it. If you're, if you're in the United States, you will not be told that you're the winner in any kind of thread below in YouTube. So do not answer anything like that. If someone says you won, it's going to come from a direct email address from audio Hawks or a phone call from us. And uh, you'll never pay shipping or anything like that. So I just wanted to be clear on that. All right, guys, that's a wrap. And until next time, my friends keep listening.